Okay, it's 9.30 now, so we are starting on, on time. And uh, if, you, uh, if you are still standing up and uh, getting breakfast, uh, get your breakfast and coffee. And if you can sit down to start the event, uh, that will be great. And the first, I'd like to invite uh, director, the Professor Giwok Shin, who is the director of uh, APOC, to the podium to, for the welcome remark. Okay, uh, thanks Takeo, and good morning and happy Friday. So I was talking to uh, Tom uh, this morning then, uh, he was teasing me that uh, I wear a tie uh, in California. So I was telling him that uh, I wear only four times a year. So already this is my third time. <laughs> so I got only one more uh, you know, to have uh, in the coming years. I, I think out of uh, respect uh, for our guests, uh, especially uh, coming from Japan, so I wear a uh, tie today. But it's really, uh, so I'm gi Shin, I'm director of uh, Children's Asia Pacific uh, Research Center here at Stanford. And I'm really uh, pleased and honored uh, to welcome all of you to today's uh, symposium on the past, present, and future international order in East Asia. So as you know, this symposium is uh, sponsored by uh, the Japan uh, Institute of International Affairs, uh, Japan's premier foreign affairs uh, think tank, and uh, our own uh, Japan program, and the U.S. Asia uh, Security Initiative. You know, we value uh, you know, cooperation with uh, Asian uh, institutions uh, we are very you know, happy to collaborate uh, with uh, GIA, a natural partner to our center whose mission is to address critical issues affecting the countries of Asia, their regional and global affairs, and U.S.-Asian uh, relations. In the post-1945 uh, era, our thinking about uh, Indo-Asia Pacific uh, security and international uh, cooperation issues has been underpinned by the narratives of a U.S.-led international order uh, centered around <coughs> the rule of law, uh, economic openness, and multilateralism. So now this post-World War II order uh, is being uh, challenged uh, very seriously. So I think it's a great time to uh, ask questions like what are the prospects uh, for the liberal internationalism and world order? What can the United States and its allies like Japan do to rethink the vision of the post-World War II uh, international project, uh, especially in the context of East Asia and what are Japan's and China's role in the regard? To address uh, these issues and questions, uh, today we assembled a group of uh, leading experts across multiple fields, uh, from international relations to political and diplomatic history in Asia, uh, American foreign policy and history, Chinese and Japanese politics and security, and U.S.-Asia regional engagement. So I'm very much looking forward to uh, insightful and productive uh, discussion throughout the conference today. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Ambassador uh, Kenichiro Sasae, uh, President of GIA, uh, to make a uh, few remarks. Uh, Ambassador Sasae joined the Japanese Foreign Service after graduating from the University of Tokyo in 1974. His uh, distinguished uh, diplomatic career includes such assignments as executive assistant to the prime minister, director general of the Economic Affairs Bureau, uh, director general of the Asian and uh, Oceanic Affairs Bureau, and vice minister for foreign affairs. He was Japan's uh, representative to the six party talks on North Korea also worked as political director for the G8 summit 
and then uh, served as ambassador of Japan uh, to United States from 2012 to 2018. I think six years is quite a long time for any ambassador to, to I guess, uh, DC from, from Tokyo. So he has been leading uh, GIA as its uh, president uh, since June of last year. So please welcome uh, Ambassador Sasae. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sint, for the kind introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Ken Sasai, uh, uh, former government official. I'm uh, now starting a happy life as a private citizen. Uh, I'm very much delighted uh, to come back uh, to Stanford. Uh, you know why? I started my younger days at Stanford. Uh, uh, you know why I came to Stanford? I didn't come to study at Stanford. I came to uh, have a fun in playing golf. And uh, I was back in 1976. I was uh, studying at the Swarthmore College in the East Coast. One of my friends was at the graduate school here. He invited me over uh, to stay in his apartment. And I, uh, and I knew that there is a nice golf course at Stanford. And he, uh, but he told me that but you have to be a student. <laughs> so I applied for the summer school. And, uh, and, I, uh, I, uh, I, and I chose the, the class. The class was uh, American body politics, and which I didn't know anything about. But uh, it was a great, great memory of uh, how I perceived the wealth of America. Two dollars playing golf, nice, you know. Uh, uh, that was symbolizing wealth of America and generosity of America at the time. But um, I want to thank, uh, first of all, Dr. Sin uh, and, and also uh, Dr. Hoshi uh, to organize uh, this event uh, together with Zier. And uh, <coughs> without uh, their you know, uh, preparation and support, this didn't happen. And also I want to thank uh, you know, Ambassador Carl you know, Eikenberry uh, you know, uh, and also Ambassador Amakost. And uh, you know, this didn't start without uh, my communication with uh, these, these uh, gentlemen, uh, and I want to thank both of you uh, to make this uh, happening. Um, <coughs> Stanford, you know, has enormous reputations uh, for the academic leadership. We all know. I don't have to feature you on this one, but so I, I want to thank all the participants uh, from Stanford and also the uh, other part of the United States that include uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Lipsy, Dr. Christensen, uh, who used to be uh, my colleagues in the State Department uh, many years ago, uh, Six Party Talk and other issues, and also Dr. Paul uh, Snyder, uh, Don Snyder, sorry, yeah, and where are you? Right. Yeah, okay, all right. And also uh, 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 Dr. Uh, you know, Fallon and uh, Dr. Kennedy and Dr. Lin, and Dr. Lampson, and and also I want to thank uh, Dr. Uh, and also Jim Shaw, right? And uh, we used to be working together in Washington some years. Again, thank you for coming. And also I want to thank Dr. Kawashima, uh, Dr. Jimbo, Dr. Inoue, and Dr. Sahashi coming all the way uh, uh, from Japan to participate in this meeting. And also uh, my colleagues uh, from GIR, uh, Dr. You know, Kotani and uh, he's expert on the defense issues. And also Dr. Mira and Dr. Wilkinson and participating as a lab tool. I, um, I'm very much looking forward uh, to this uh, symposium today. The uh, symposium is the, uh, uh, the past, uh, present, and future international order in East Asia. You know, my, uh, my great you know, uh, you know, ambassador uh, finally, I was a uh, young, uh, uh, young uh, diplomat. Uh, his name is Ambassador Okazaki. Some of you might know him. He's a kind of a strategist, but perhaps uh, Ambassador Amakos, you know him. And uh, he, uh, he was always telling to us, when you like to see what could happen uh, from now, uh, a month or so, 
you need to go back to uh, uh, that past year. You have to see what happened. If you want to see the 10 years ahead, you need to go back uh, 100 years. If you want to see 100 years from now, you need to go back to 1,000 years in the past. That's what he was saying. So uh, and today, um, we ob would obviously address uh, the current issues of East Asia. But first, we go back and look at what happened in this history, including uh, uh, Bill Sai system, Washington system, and San Francisco system. So uh, uh, what is uh, important for us today is not only uh, to remind us what happened, but what was the meaning of, of these uh, uh, past institutions and present institution, because what's happening today uh, here in the United States and, and the world is, is a problem systemic, is a system crumbling, or uh, that is this simply a tentative deviations, or could we fix it? And, uh, and so uh, if we are going to address all these questions, uh, it might be a good idea for us uh, to look back uh, what was a failure, uh, what was a success. And, uh, and these points uh, are a good starting point for us to, to work on. When we address all these current uh, issues of East Asia, I don't have to get into all this detail. Uh, we will discuss about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we all know that when we s talk about strategic uh, stability of the region, we can't really escape how all this triangular relationship between the United States, uh, China, and Japan will be shaping up. And uh, obviously, all these countries are bound uh, by the uh, experience in the history. You cannot talk about uh, Japan today without the fact that uh, uh, we had a war with the United States. We had a history of uh, advancing into China and we had a colonized uh, Korean Peninsula. And today, we are still bound by those experiences. For example, if you look at the uh, Japanese uh, uh, passive, I don't say passive, but the pacifist mode on the concept of military force. Uh, not only talking about the constitution, but also, you know, uh, we are unique in that sense. And uh, we ca you can't really, you know, discuss this issue without looking to the fact that the Japan defeated war because we misuse, mishandle uh, the military power at the time. Uh, when uh, we, we look at China, you know, uh, all these obsessions of foreign interventions don't matter with Chinese affairs, cannot really uh, be discussed without the fact that they had suffered over 100 years by foreign intervention into Chinese, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> politics or the society. Even the United States, I mean, uh, you know, if, uh, if you look at the history of the United States, the United States uh, international commitment, moving forward, very positive, and swinging back to, I don't say isolationist, but uh, uh, reduce or rebalance its own global commitment and f focus more on the domestic agenda. All these histories uh, uh, go back and forth. And so why are we now, uh, you know, putting all this together and how all this current you know, order of East Asia is now being challenged? And what are the, uh, you know, fundamental uh, basis of the strategic s stability among the majors like uh, United States, China, and Japan? And what are the other uh, countries in the region will be a factor in place in terms of uh, stabilizing the region. And also, uh, I'm very much interested in listening to uh, the uh, you know, speakers or participants' uh, perceptions about this power relationship that would include the uh, power of uh, democracy uh, and the power of uh, market economy and free economy. United States today, uh, very interesting debate, right? I mean, on the far left, uh, people are uh, talking about a kind of a socialist uh, way of uh, policy, which is not a socialism in, in, a, in other countries like uh, Europe and even Japan. But, uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, military power. I mean, 
it is obvious we are seeing growing military competitions, not only simply between the United States and Russia now we see, but also China is growing. What is the limit and cap? And we don't know uh, where it is heading for. And, and then finally, what is the power of diplomacy? What is alliance relationship uh, around the United States? How is that going? So um, these issues uh, would require new set of uh, regime, or is the current regime sufficient enough? So these are very interesting subjects for me uh, to, to look for. And in Japan, you know that there is a new uh, emperor uh, com uh, coming uh, to the office. And uh, the sentiment in Japan and spirit in Japan is very much uh, uh, fresh and uh, forward-looking. And uh, uh, the fact that the change of emperor, uh, you know, is not really uh, changing the fundamental of foreign uh, policy or, or even politics, but the, I think the important thing is the spirit of the day. I think in that way, uh, Japanese people are basically uh, trying to look at the region in a positive way and uh, try to do better uh, for the region. So with that, uh, I could conclude my uh, my remarks, but uh, once again, I want to thank everyone for coming and joining us. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, this is Takeo Hoshi. I'm the director of the Japan program at Asia Pacific Research Center. And I know many of you are thinking the three welcome remarks are too much. Uh, don't worry, I'll be brief. Uh, I just want to add uh, to the thanks that uh, Ambassador Sasai mentioned. In addition to all of those people, I'd like to recognize six more people who really did the work for uh, today's conference. Uh, even though my name and Carl's name is on the program as our organizers, but the real work has been done by these uh, six uh, staff members, uh, both at APAC, Asia Pacific Research Center, and JIIA. So I'd like to thank uh, Meiko Kotani, uh, I'm not sure if Oh, Mako is over there, okay. And Belinda Yeomans, Belinda is over there. Jessica Lopez, uh, Kiyomi Okubo, Chihiro Shikata, Hiroko Yoshimura. So those are the people who really made this uh, conference uh, possible. And also today, uh, other staff members from APOC are helping out us. So I'd like to thank all of them for making this possible. And with that, I'd like to invite the first panel to the stage and hand it over to the chair of the first panel, Dan Schneider. Good morning, and uh, thank you to everyone for coming, and of course, thank you to JIA and to uh, the Japan program and the U.S. Asia Security Initiative at APARC for organizing this. And I think uh, Ambassador Sasai actually gave the introduction to this panel uh, already. Uh, I'll just summarize it in some sense, which is that I think one of the uh, things I really like about the symposium, having attended many, many discussions of uh, U.S. and Japan, is that I like the framing of looking at this question of international orders and, change and challenges to the existing international order, uh, as well as understanding the legacy, uh, the historical legacy that we are still living with uh, in East Asia. And I thought Ambassador Sasai very uh, wonderfully talked about uh, the fact that uh, history really lives on, not only the legacy of the war, uh, and the systems that evolved out of that, but of course even the interwar period between World War I and World War II, uh, and the changing systems of power, the structures of order in East Asia, and what lessons they, uh, they give to us today as we look at this, uh, I think, very serious challenge to uh, that legacy uh, today. 
So I, uh, this is a really great panel, and it's meant, I think, to set, in some sense, that historical uh, and broad uh, strategic background to the discussions that will follow. Uh, I'm not going to give long introductions to the panelists. You can find uh, their biographies in, your, in this wonderful pamphlet. Um, David Kennedy, as people at Stanford know, is just a, a, a wonderful and fabulous historian uh, of American history. And uh, uh, there are many high school students all across the country who are benefiting from him in, the, in that he is the author of the principal textbook uh, for those preparing to go to university in, uh, in American history. Uh, and it's a great textbook, among other, many other things he's written. <coughs> so I want to point that one out. And he'll start us off, and he'll be followed by another fabulous historian and a good friend, uh, Kawashima Shin, who is, uh, I think, one of Japan's really not only preeminent historians and specialists on China, but also a, a, a deep thinker about Japan and Japan's role uh, in the world, and followed by Professor Inoue, uh, from s who is a political historian, um, and then by Professor Lin at the end, who uh, is the curator of the uh, China collection at the Hoover Institution, which is a very, very important collection for those who are doing work on contemporary China. So I think we'll cover a lot of ground, and I'm not going to talk any further so that I give everybody time to proceed. And I, I will say uh, there are timekeepers, this is for everybody here, um, and they will be flashing little signs uh, to keep you on your, on your marks. And other than that, you're off. What is it? How much time does it have? I think it's 12 minutes. <coughs> well, thank you, Dan. Um, this the title of this panel is Comparing the Versailles-Washington System and the San Francisco System, Lessons from the Rise and Fall of International Orders in East Asia. I expect that the other panelists are going to have a lot more to say about the details of those two systems, and I'm going to try to offer a kind of high altitude framework for understanding the evolution of American foreign policy over the last century or more. And in the paper, the, the one page I submitted by way of uh, anticipating this, the sum my summary of remarks, I promised to explicate a famous remark of Woodrow Wilson's about uh, the world must be made safe for democracy, which is a line from his war address of April 2nd, 1917. But in order to get to that, to explicating that remark, I want to back up a bit and uh, share with you another remark that Woodrow Wilson made on July 4th, 1914, just as World War I was beginning to take shape. And he s asked a rhetorical question at a 4th of July celebration at Independence Hall in Philadelphia on July 4th, 1914. And he, he said the following. He said, what are we going to do with the influence and power of this great nation? Are we going to play the old role of using that power for our aggrandizement and material benefit only? Now, actually, that question might seem kind of bland and plain vanilla white bread to us today, but he actually asked that, posed that question in the midst of a very active and vigorous debate in the United States in the first decade and a half to two decades of the 20th century when following the rather amazingly rapid projection of American power into the Caribbean and, uh, of course, into Asia with the annexation of the Philippines, uh, the, a vigorous debate took place in this country about what exactly should be the premises and aspirations of American foreign policy. And broadly speaking, there were three positions that were put forward then, and to some degree, all three of them are recognizably still alive today. The first was a uh, commitment to, to double down on and recapture the ancient American tradition of isolation. And this uh, was, of course, the doctrine more or less described by in Washington, George Washington's farewell address. Uh, and there were active proponents of that, uh, people who deeply criticized and regretted the American imperial expansion into the Caribbean and to Asia in uh, the Spanish-American War in 1898, for example. William James, the great American philosopher, brother of the great American novelist Henry James, when he heard of President McKinley's decision to annex the Philippines, William James, mild-mannered Harvard professor of philosophy, said, God damn the United States. How can it puke up its ancient soul in five seconds without a wink of squeamishness and become a colonial power? So that was a strong sentiment in the United States, and it, it had deep roots in a century of practice and attitudes going back all the way to George Washington. 
Second position was, uh, you might associate it most uh, easily with Theodore Roosevelt, and Roosevelt's position was basically, the time has come for the United States to become a great power, take its seat at the table, uh, and behave as other great powers did, and indeed Roosevelt knew, as others did at the time, that the United States by then was the world's, uh, had the world's largest economy, the world's most extensive transportation network, was the biggest producer of energy and coal and so on and so forth. And Roosevelt, for example, wrote to his friend, the former British ambassador Cecil Spring Rice, in, uh, I believe, late August 1914, as World War I was now an active shooting war in Europe. And Roosevelt said, had I been in power, I would have declared war on Germany four weeks ago. So clearly Roosevelt just wanted to get in the game, and he wanted the United States to be in the game. The third position is the one that Woodrow Wilson was trying to uh, articulate, and if isolationism and great power diplomacy are the first two positions, the third we might call, generally speaking, Wilsonianism. We've debated ever after what Wilsonianism means, uh, but I would argue, if we get down to that level of detail, that the Wilsonian tradition has been the core tradition of American diplomacy for the last century or more, and we can talk about that further if you like. But that's where we get to, I think, to the understanding of what uh, Wilson was trying to get at when he said in his war address, we must make the world safe for democracy. It's worth noting, I think, that when he took the United States into the war in 1917, the war by that time was nearly three years old. So the United States was a very late uh, belligerent, number one. Number two, the official name of the coalition uh, against uh, uh, the Kaiser's Germany at that time in Austria-Hungary, the official name of the coalition once the United States joined the war was the Allied and Associated Powers. So the United States refused to become a formal ally, fought alongside the British and the French, and for a while the Russians, uh, only as an associated power. Again, a sense, a very trying to communicate a sense that the United States would not behave simply as another great power. It had some other agenda, remained to be fully articulated. And it's also worth remembering that the Wilson administration adamantly refused to amalgamate American troops into the British and French ranks and instead insisted on withholding the great bulk of American military force until an independent sector under semi-independent American command could be established by General John Pershing. So again, very, very clear signals, it seems to me, at least in historical uh, hindsight, that the United States, under Wilson's leadership, intended to play some other kind of diplomatic and even military role in the post-war period. So this leads me to a couple of observations uh, that do, I think, braid into our understanding of the so-called uh, Washington, Versailles, and San Francisco systems. Uh, both of them are the products of wars. And the first system, it seems to me, is very consistent with the kind of irresolution and debate about American foreign policy that we see uh, evinced in that first couple of decades of the 20th century and in Wilson's policies, and I'll return to that in a moment. And of course, the, uh, the, the so-called San Francisco system is, I think, unambiguously uh, the product of uh, World War II and uh, its aftermath in Asia and indeed around the world. So that's one very consistent uh, thread that runs through all this, that the, both of these systems uh, of uh, international order, particularly in East Asia, are in some very, very definite ways the products of the respective wars, World War I and World War II. Uh, the other element that it seems to me is so self-evidently there that I don't need to belabor it is that in both cases, China figured prominently, if not fully in a fully articulated way, in the thinking that went into these, designing these two systems of security uh, architecture. Uh, the American position in China, however we care to explain it, is certainly uh, marked, uh, if it doesn't go back all the way to Caleb Cushing and the Treaty of Wanjia, it's certainly rooted in the open door notes of Secretary Hay in 1899, 1900, uh, and of course the preoccupation with China as a communist state uh, by 1949, 1950 is, uh, doesn't need, again, I don't think I need to belabor the point. Uh, but let me just say that the, the uh, Washington Naval Conference, so-called Washington system that, uh, to which the, gives its name to this um, uh, security architecture system that we're talking about, uh, is a direct product of the, the same kind of thinking that Woodrow Wilson brought 
to World War, to, to American foreign policy in the early 20th century and the way in which his administration waged the, waged the war. Making the world safe for democracy, I believe, despite the reinterpretation of that doctrine by some neoconservatives in the last couple of decades, I believe what Wilson meant by that doctrine is we need to construct an international order that would relieve democracies from the necessity of maintaining large military forces, standing armies, and devoting large portions of their GDP to the maintenance of a security apparatus. This is an idea that goes back at least as far as the Enlightenment, uh, when it was thought that uh, free trade, free markets, and so on uh, would uh, to some degree de-link national economic policy and national security policy, not completely, but to some degree, and pacify the world. And I think that is the, the core assumption that lies behind that whole apparatus of Wilsonian diplomacy. Uh, of course, we know, that despite the gesture of the Washington Conference and the famous 553 naval ratio in the Pacific, somebody at the time described that as Rolls-Royce, Rolls-Royce, Ford, uh, that nonetheless, it, the, 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 the logic or the aspirational uh, outcome was to relieve the burden of arms buildup on this and other societies. And that's perfectly consistent, it seems to me, with what Wilson meant when he said, make the world safe for democracy. But Wilson, as we know, again, an old story, did not, was not able amongst his countrymen to summon the political will to really make the United States a consistent international enga internationally engaged player. The United States refuses to join the league, uh, puts up some of the highest tariffs in its history, uh, enacts the most restrictive immigration legislation in its history, insists on the repatriation of treasury loans to the allied governments during the war, all kinds of ways the United States in the interwar period becomes a, the, it enters the most isolationist phase of its history. So it's a reversion to a uh, 19th century way of doing business and e indeed even more deeply so. We come to World War II and the story is different. It, it seems to me, uh, to me almost ar unarguable that World War II affords the United States not only the capacity but also shapes the political will uh, at last, a generation or more later, to make the Wilsonian dream of an international order possible at least to some significant degree. And again, I don't think I need to rehearse here just how extraordinarily uh, asymmetric was American power vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world in 1945. Uh, and that moment constituted, I believe, what uh, some scholars might call a Groschian moment. That's the name, of course, for the great Dutch theorist of international affairs, Hugo Grotius, in the 17th century. Uh, who and A Groschian moment has been defined as, at least when I in my dictionary as, quote, a paradigm shifting development in which new rules and doctrines of customary international law emerge with unusual rapidity and acceptance. And that's what happened in 1945 and the years immediately thereafter, that some measure or some recognizably d descendant version of the Wils Wilsonian vision was implemented and the United States began to uh, craft multi, very explicitly multilateral relationships in the European in Atlantic theaters, and uh, although I understand the distinction between multilateral and hub and spoke architecture, it seems to me the outcome or the practical effect of American diplomacy in Asia was uh, pretty comparable to what it was in Europe, uh, to provide a security umbrella to allow societies to develop their uh, civil economies, uh, relieve them of the burden of sustained military expenditure, and to prosper everybody and pacify the world in the process. So to this extent, it seems to me there's a direct line that runs from the open door notes of 1899 to uh, sponsoring Chinese membership in the WTO uh, more than a century uh, later. So let me just end with a, uh, a remark that I frequently cite because it's historically accurate and also I think aspirationally uh, important. And it's a remark made uh, by Winston Churchill on 16 August 1945, the day after the Japanese had indicated their intention to surrender. And uh, Churchill gave a speech on the floor of parliament in which he, among the reasons this attracted my attention when I first saw it, is he used a figure of speech that had long since passed out of common usage in American English. He rendered the United States as a plural noun. And he said, the United States stand at this moment at the summit of the world. I think that was a very, uh, accurate statement in 1945. But then he said two following sentences that I think 
uh, help us to understand where American diplomacy went in that post-war period. He said, I rejoice that it should be so. Let her use her vast power, not just for herself, but for the well-being of all peoples in all lands, and a new era will open in the history of mankind. I don't think it's just American chauvinism to uh, stress the point that, that that was an animating impulse in American diplomacy in the post-World War II period, and I think that was a Grotian moment. Whether we're now in another Grotian moment where we're about to revolutionize the premises and architecture of our international security system, I think is one of the questions uh, for us in this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, good morning. It is my great pleasure to be here to discuss on this big problem, big issue. Uh, my background is historian, and uh, my specialist is Chinese diplomatic deep history. But uh, today, I would like to talk about the uh, East Asian international relations in the uh, 1930s. Um, yes, uh, what is the question on this presentation? Uh, the framework of Washington uh, well, let's say Washington system explain the uh, coordination among the big powers, uh, because uh, among the Jap uh, USA, Britain, and um, Japan, and others after World War One. Uh, in uh, World War One, Japan yes uh, required twenty one demands to China and others, so uh, the powers uh, recover the new uh, the uh, reset the uh, new norms in China and the Pacific. And also this uh, framework explains the, uh, also the processes of the breaking of the framework of Washington system just mean the road to the, the uh, World War Second or Pacific War between Japan and the uh, USA or Britain. However, I feel uh, some uncomfortableness. Uh, maybe because I am the historian of Chinese history. So for example, uh, Chinese scholars or Taiwanese scholars in Ch Ch China and Taiwan, they do not uh, pay strong attention to the called Washington system. Yes, Japanese history really likes to talk about the Washington system. However, Chinese history now. So that this is framework explain the dynamism of the history in East Asia. This is my big question. My question. So what is the Washington, Washington system? Uh, yes. As you know, the uh, after the uh, boxer rising in. Uh, uh, the first decade in the 20th century, uh, powers signed the uh, so-called Beijing Pro Peking Protocol in 1901. But after the burning out of the World War I, yes, uh, Western countries uh, could not pay attention to the East Asian situation, so Japan required the 20, 20 demands and others. So, and also uh, Anglo-Japanese alliance was the first with the problems in the 1910s and 20s. So, uh, Washington Conference was held in 1921 uh, uh, and 22nd at Washington, and three treaties were signed by powers. Those three treaties were the basis of the so-called Washington system. The first is the Four Power Treaty on the uh, norm of the Pacific. Uh, for power is Japan, uh, USA, Japan, Britain, and France. Uh, second is about the four, uh, no, Five Power Treaty so-called Washington Naval Treaty on the Naval Disarmament. Uh, yes, five, five, three, yeah. USA, Britain, Japan, and Italy and France. Third is about the, the, the third is the nine party treaty on China. Uh, this treaty has uh, other spirits of the so-called open door policy or uh, integrity of China and so on. Uh, what is the nine power? Yes, uh, besides for the uh, Britain, USA, Japan, and uh, France, uh, Holland, Belgium, Portuguese, and China, Beijing, Beijing government. Okay. So um, USA, Britain, France, and Japan, these four powers signed all of three treaty of them. Uh, besides for the uh, Washington uh, three treaties, 
uh, League of Nations was also the uh, subsystem of Washington or a Washington system, I think. Uh, USA did not uh, join the uh, League of Nations, but the powers, uh, Britain, France, and Japan, um, kept uh, some balances in the League of Nations. And I'm so interested in that the uh, Asian countries, including China, or Persia, or, or Siam, these countries and the Latin American countries and the East European countries uh, got some chances to join the platform uh, of international affairs as a nation, the League of Nations. Oh, so uh, the formation of the Washington Conference, uh, sorry, sorry, formation of Washington system at the Washington Conference, yes, uh, this uh, formation recovered the norm of the uh, confusion caused by the World War I and adjusted the uh, new international situation under the uh, new trend, like the uh, USA is uh, rising, as Pro uh, Professor Kennedy said. How did the uh, system, yes, broken? Uh, generally speaking, in uh, 20, 1927 8, the Japan sent troops to Shandong Peninsula to absorb the so called Northern Expedition and the uh, Manchurian incident in 1913, and the uh, Japanese was withdrawal and, uh, from the League of Nations in 1933, and so on, the processes. However, uh, if we, co we consider about the Washington system, we have to uh, want the, uh, consider about one big point. Uh, Kwantung Army and Japan adopted the so-called aggressive policy uh, with options towards the uh, China. What, what was the reason? Uh, generally speaking, the reason was, reasons were the pressure of the Soviet Union and the KMT Gomintan revolution in 1920s. So under the pressure of the Soviet Union and the KMT's revolution, powers cannot, could not keep the uh, some cooperate or co coordination uh, to co cope with these problems. And the system itself uh, could not, yes, include or accept these outer elements. That's a big problem. So why did the system subsume these outer elements? Or well, why did the powers, or why did not powers find out the some, yes, the same policies towards these, uh, some pressures or challenging from the outside of the system? I said about uh, talking about the uh, much more detailed situation in China. As I said, uh, ROC Beijing government, not KMT, Beijing government signed the uh, Nine Powers Treaty. So China, China itself has also commitment for the system, us in the, us in the system. However, however, at first, eight powers besides excess for Ch Beijing government did not support Beijing government to exist. Uh, actually, the Beijing government at that time was faced with a big financial problem. So, at Washington conference, China requires to uh, get the uh, tariff autonomy to get money. However, the treaty itself uh, was not ratified soon after the Washington conference. France extended rat ratification until 1925. So the Beijing government uh, was facing was uh, this bankrupt big problem. And also a KMT government in uh, Guangdong. KMT government was not signer of the nine treaty, nine powers treaty. So the Guangdong, Guangdong Canton government of KMT was outside of the nine powers treaty. And also the Guangdong government was supported by Soviet Union, so strongly. Okay. So about the situation, the uh, KMT's Northern Expedition, not Expedition, Expedition and National Revolution. 
came to Northern Expedition and the Natural Revolution was the slogan, Revolutionary Diplomacy, Gumi Waijiao in Chinese. Um, stimulated Japan and Guangdong Army so strongly that Japan sends troops to Shandong to, uh, to disturb it. However, however, Britain, okay, that had uh, uh, the most, that, that, that were the most biggest interest of holder in China, adopted more modest policy toward KMT Northern Expedition, especially after the uh, USA 53 jail incident. Uh, Britain changed its China policy toward China in 90, the end of the 1925. So Britain, Japan, it's the, the, there are some differences uh, of policy toward China between Japan and, Ch Japan and Britain at the time. So powers cannot share the policy, same policy toward the outer elements, and Japan violated the spirit of the open door policy and the in, in, in integrity, in the integrity of China. And also USA adopted its own way, own policy toward Chinese tariff autonomy. China accept, uh, USA accepted uh, the requirement from China on the tariff autonomy in 1928. This timing is different from Britain and Japan. So such a coordination was broken or the, or the facing a big problem in the 1980s, so in the 1920s, sorry. In 1928, KMT's nationalist government unified China and succeeded the status of the uh, central government of China. Then KMT government became a member of nine power treaty. Okay. However, Japan still adopted the uh, strict and aggressive policy stance towards uh, the KMT, especially on the problem of recognition and tariff autonomy then. And it, it's so interesting, KMT government, because the KMT government became the uh, member of the Nine, Nine Poros Treaty as a succession of the Beijing government, KMT government utilized the spirit of the, the treaty, the open door or the uh, integrity of China to protect itself. Okay. And uh, yes, uh, blame Japan, a Japanese action, Japanese policy was violence of the nine, nine, uh, nine Pearl Treaty and so on. So, especially after the 931 Manchuria incident, yes, uh, Japan, uh, China blamed for, for Japan, uh, China blamed for Japan on the point of the nine, nine Pearl Treaty, okay, and also required other seven powers to accept the Chinese concept, Chinese uh, opinion against Japan However, nine, the nine powers, yes, did not accept it, the Chinese requirement, but uh, the other point, you see, at the League of Nations, China also raised the point issue of the Japanese aggression in a, on the Manchuria incident, and also League of Nations decided to send the Litton Commission towards East Asia. Yes, and the, the, at, at the last Japan withdrew the uh, League of Nations in 1933. So, but at that time, Japanese government also considered about the meaning of the Washington, Washington system. For example, Mamoru Shigemitsu or the Hachiro Arida. Uh, Japanese government at first adopt, adopted the modest policy toward China under the Washington system, like Shigemitsu, and other uh, and also uh, we have to point out that at that time diplomats recognized that uh, the most important condition of the Russian system wa was China accepts the uh, China also keeps kept the, the the special interest of Japan in the Manchuria and so on. If China keep kept the foreign interest in China, it's okay. Japan also can share the Washington spirit of Washington system. So Japanese side did not imagine the KMT's revolutionary diplomacy to recover all of the uh, lost national rights, like so-called Japanese special rights in Manchuria. So after in uh, a 1926 and 1927, so-called 
not the northern expedition, Japan in Japan, the, uh, there were some controversies about the Washington system. And after the 1932, Japan built the Manchu Manchu War. Yes, Japan in Japan, as you said, diplomats uh, argue about the uh, how how to leave the Washington system, like Arita Hachiro. And at last, Japan pronounced the AMO statement in 1935. <laughs> so I'll make a brief uh, conclusion. Um, the framework of Washington, or we say Washington system, only explained the coordination among the powers only after the World War I, and also explained the reason or the processes uh, toward the World War I and the Pacific War. However, we have to consider the uh, outer elements of this system. That's caused the break of the system. The coordination of the existing powers sometimes cannot correspond to the new change of international order, international affairs. The system does not have flexibility to include the new elements or some domestic situation. For example, Japanese nationalistic unilateralism Make it, made it difficult to share the common stance with the USA and the Britain to, yes, in response to the new situation or China rising the Soviet Union. So this point, one system and the outer elements is so crucial for the uh, Washington system at the time. So how about the, the situation in the San Francisco system? This question will be answered by the Minoru Sensei. Thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. Actually, Professor Lin, if you'll go next, and then we'll finish with you. Know. Okay. So I hope you allow me to see here. <coughs> Thank you, everyone. So the Washington system and the San Francisco system both play a critical role in the formation of international order in East Asia. And they also generated huge impact on China in terms of its domestic and external affairs. I'm going to touch on China's place in the Asia order between First and Second World War. Why there is a debate that the San Francisco Peace Conference left Taiwan's sovereignty undetermined and the implication of the system in the making of a nationalist Chinese state on Taiwan after 1949. So in 1922, the Nine Power Treaty concluded at the Washington Conference marked the internationalization of the U.S. open door policy in China. The treaty promised that each power respected the territorial integrity of China and affirmed the importance of equal opportunity for all nations doing business in the country. China, then represented by the Beijing government, agreed um, <coughs> agreed not to discriminate against any country seeking to do business there. Japan and China also signed an agreement under which Japan would return Shandong province and the railway it occupied during World War for, uh, First World War. Uh, given China's relatively weak position around that time, we can fairly argue that Beijing had made pretty good achievements. But not everyone in China was happy with the Washington system. Sun Yat-sen, the founding father of the Chinese Republic, and his nationalist followers view the system a product of Western imperialism and strongly advocate the restoration of China's rights through drastic means, not through treaty diplomacy performed by Beijing. So we see that in the mid-1920s, the Chinese Nationalist Party, or um, the Kuomintang, mobilized mass movement in order to abrogate unequal treaties and regain its rights. But when Chiang Kai-shek um, unified China in the late 1920s, he began to moderate his foreign policy stance. He now believed that the Washington system would provide a secure environment for him to undertake domestic reforms. After the Marco Polo Bridge incident of 1937, when an all-out confrontation with Japan became inevitable, Chiang Kai-shek even resorted to the nine power treaty signatories for one final mediation, hoping that the Washington system would save China from a total war with Japan, but it did not succeed. So the outbreak of World War II meant the collapse of the Washington system, whereas the end of World War II 
indicated the brewing of a new international order. But the civil war between the Kuomintang and the Chinese communists prevent a new Asia order to take shape immediately. The Truman administration adapted a policy of waiting for the dust to settle in China and virtually abandoned Chiang Kai-shek and the Kuomintang remnants on Taiwan. But things changed dramatically after the outbreak of the Korean War in June 1950. Truman swiftly ordered the Seventh Fleet to the Taiwan Strait to prevent military operations against and from the island. He also stated that the determination of the future status of Taiwan must await a peace settlement with Japan. By this statement, President Truman had pulled away from the earlier position that the island was for all intents and purposes Chinese territory. Why such a change? Because only on the premise that the island's legal status remained unsettled could the U.S. government claim that its intervention did not constitute interference in Chinese domestic affairs. The PRC's involvement in the Korean War reinforced the U.S. position to realign itself with Chiang Kai-shek and support the Kuomintang government on Taiwan. Washington also sped up the process of concluding a peace treaty with Japan. But there was a problem. The British and several other countries had already recognized the PRC and insisted that Beijing, not Taipei, should be invited to participate in the peace conference to be held in San Francisco. So in the end, there was a compromise between Washington and London. No Chinese government across the Taiwan Strait would participate in the event. And Japan's future dealings toward China would be decided by Japan itself on the basis of its sovereign and independent status conferred by the treaty. So when the San Francisco conference took place in September 1971, neither Taipei nor Beijing sent the delegation. Chiang Kai-shek in Taipei was extremely disappointed that his government, having fought with the Japanese for eight long years, was being excluded while his for former defeated enemy was now in a position to choose with whom he wished to deal. As a show of protest and anger, he refused to take any food on the day the peace treaty was signed. Beijing also issued a statement denouncing the treaty as illegal and should not be recognized. With US support, a bilateral peace treaty was signed between the ROC, the Republic of China and Taiwan and Japan in April the next year. He followed the San Francisco Peace Treaty by stating that Japan relinquished sovereignty over Taiwan and the Pescadores without specifying who succeeded to legal jurisdiction over the island. He only added that all residents of Taiwan were deemed as nationals of the Republic of China. Today, supporters of Taiwan independence still argue that the language in both San Francisco and Taipei treaties proves the notion that Taiwan is not a part of China because they do not explicitly state the transfer of so sovereignty over Taiwan from Japan. In fact, throughout the 1950s, the 60s, and the early 1970s, standard U.S. State Department response to this issue was that sovereignty over Taiwan and the Pescadores was an unsettled question subject to future international resolution. Even though Chiang Kai-shek was extremely unhappy about the peace treaty arrangement, from a long-term perspective, I believe the government on Taiwan benefited substantially from the creation of the so-called San Francisco system. First, it allowed a once defeated and failed regime to regain its political legitimacy and international recognition. Although Taipei was, not, was excluded from the San Francisco Conference, 38 out of the 48 signatories subsequently resumed or established diplomatic ties with Chinese government, allowing Taipei to perform and pretend like one of the world's big five for the next two decades. Number two, at the height of the Cold War, the San Francisco system helped create political military and economic commitments between the United States and multiple allies in East Asia as a grand strategy to contain communism. 
The peace treaty with Japan in 1952 paved the way for the nationals on Taiwan to sign a mutual defense treaty with America two years later, making Taiwan more secure against the PRC. In the following two decades, within the San Francisco framework, Taipei received substantial military and economic aid from the United States and laid the foundation for subsequent economic development and prosperity in the 70s and beyond. But given the contents, the spirit, and the scope of application of Taipei Peace Treaty and the U.S.-Taiwan Mutual Defense Treaty, I would say that they also reinforce legal and political reality that the territorial and jurisdiction scope of the Republic of China would be permanently rooted on the island of Taiwan. In other words, after, after 1949, while Kuomintang leaders, including Chiang Kai-shek, endeavored to legitimize Taipei as the sole government representing the whole of China by entering into more international agreements. Ironically, the two most important ones they signed with Japan and the United States only demystify such a claim. In retrospect, the San Francisco system played a crucial role in the making of a de facto Nationalist Party state on Taiwan. The ambiguities it deliberately or in unintention, unintentedly created regarding the sovereignty issue of Taiwan also left political controversies across the Taiwan Strait, the repercussions of which can still be felt today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> and last but not least, you know, I said there. Uh, good morning. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about the San Francisco system from the viewpoint of Japanese uh, diplomatic history. Uh, I'm not fluent in English, so uh, let me read my manuscript. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to see uh, what is the San Francisco system. According to the historian uh, Hofuya Chiro, uh, it is an international order in the Asia Pacific Pacific region on the basis of following uh, two treaties concluded in San Francisco in 1951. The Peace Treaty of Japan and the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. Uh, this system has uh, two objectives uh, corresponding to each treaty. Keywords are security and uh, reconciliation. Our first objective is uh, security to prevent the uh, spread of communism to Asia Pacific region. Uh, when the Cold War began, uh, the America created the hub and spokes network of the bilateral alliance. The US Japan Security Treaty was part of it. As the uh, Article 1 of uh, US Japan Security Treaty stated, the American military could use their uh, bases uh, in Japan not only for the defense of Japan, but also for the security of Far East. Uh, second uh, objective is a uh, reconcile between Japan and uh, neighboring countries. After the World War II, the aim of the U.S. was to transform Japan into a peaceful nation that can be coordinated with the liberal democratic camp. So uh, they established the new constitution, including uh, Article 9, Pacific Clause. Uh, the San Francisco Peace Treaty uh, provided a basis for uh, Japan to make a fresh start as a peaceful nation. At the peace conference, uh, Premier Yoshida Shigeru addressed, uh, this peace treaty is not a treaty of vengeance, uh, but a document of reconciliation and trust. In short, we can say uh, San Francisco system uh, brought uh, security and reconciliation to Asia after the collapse of the Japanese empire. Uh, well then, uh, why the uh, San Francisco system succeeded? 
Uh, it is important that system could serve the interest to all concerned countries. The U.S. has been able to deter the spread of communism in Asia with a focus on the People's Republic of China uh, by establishing uh, military bases, uh, bases uh, in Japan. On the other hand, uh, Japan also has been able to reduce the burden of uh, defense expenditure under the Security Treaty and achieve uh, economic growth. Other Asian countries are also supported the San Francisco system, owing to the memory to of Japan's invasion in the war. Asian countries uh, hoped that uh, Japan's military power would be curtailed under the protection of the United States. Even the PRC, uh, which had fearfully denounced the San Francisco Treaty, uh, admitted uh, that the U.S.-Japan security arrangement uh, played a role as a cap in the bottle of Japanese militarism in 1970s. The San Francisco system uh, wasn't completed immediately uh, following its establishment. For example, uh, Japan had the serious domestic division on U.S.-Japan security treaty. In the 1950s, leftist parties uh, decried the uh, over-dependence of Japan on the uh, United States. Moreover, the San Francisco system excluded communist countries and uh, former colonies. The Soviet Union refused to sign the peace treaty of Japan, and two Chinas and Koreas were not invited to the peace conference because of the matter of divided state. The Cold War divisions uh, hampered Japan's uh, reconciliation with those countries. But uh, compared to the Washington system, the San Francisco system had enough time to eliminate uh, destabilizing uh, 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 factors under the Cold War structure. Uh, as for the domestic division, uh, Japanese economic growth changed the situation. Uh, although the situation, uh, security treaty was a contentious issue, a uh, majority Japanese people supported the uh, moderate diplomatic course called Yoshida Doctrine, uh, continuing a limited defense capability within the framework of the peace constitution until the end of 1960s. Moreover, uh, as you can see from this slide, uh, Japan had concluded the bilateral treaty with countries uh, that didn't sign the uh, peace treaty of Japan. Uh, although it took a long time to negotiate, uh, Japan had achieved uh, reconciliation uh, as a state level with all its neighbors, uh, except for the North Korea, in the end of the 1970s. The peace diplomacy of post-war Japan uh, stabilized the San Francisco system. After that, uh, San Francisco system uh, had been stable until the end of the Cold War. But uh, new challenges emerged uh, for the system in 1990s. That is a history issue. Uh, originally, uh, the Japanese government uh, should have resolved the uh, legacies resulting from uh, World War II or uh, colonial rule in the peace treaty. But the uh, San Francisco peace treaty was a general peace uh, and contained a few punitive clauses. Japan made responsible to reparation to some countries and indeed uh, paid about 1.7 billion US dollars as reparation and uh, economic assistance in total. Yeah, that's this. Uh, but uh, these are generous uh, not to harm uh, Japan's economic recovery and uh, personal compensation was insufficient. As a result, uh, Japan's responsibilities on war and colonial rules remained uh, indeterminate. History issues with its neighbor countries, uh, such as China and Korea, remained unsettled. Finally, uh, I'd like to say uh, what will threat the San Francisco system from now. The rising China is certainly a major threat to Asia's international order. 
but uh, it will not directly threaten the San Francisco system because uh, in terms of uh, deterring uh, the military rise of Japan, uh, China is also a stakeholder of the San Francisco system. Uh, what we really have to fear is the rise of Japanese nationalism triggered by the rise of China. Uh, within the Liberal Democratic uh, Party, uh, nationalists are coupled with uh, populism have increased its influence uh, since 1990s. They insist on uh, breaking away the post-war regime, uh, deny the outcome of the occupation reform, and are set a constitutional revision as their political goal. Uh, they are trying to change the post-war regime uh, while uh, strength, uh, strengthening uh, the U.S.-Japan alliance. But uh, policy, ma policy maker uh, must remember that denying Japan's post-war history uh, as a peaceful nation uh, may undermine uh, the foundation of the San Francisco system. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, uh, I'll certainly open the floor to uh, questions from the audience, but I'd like to sort of start out by posing a big question to all of you. Uh, thank you for really wonderful presentations, which I think touched on many different pieces of the uh, both the two systems, but also uh, what drove, particularly what drove the collapse of the Washington system. And the big question for me is why did the San Francisco system proved to be so enduring. Uh, I mean, it's amazing here we are 70 years later, uh, and still the basic architecture of that system uh, remains intact and largely functional. And it's not without challenges uh, during the Cold War uh, from the Soviet Union and from uh, revolutionary China and today. What, what are the, what's the difference, if you will, between the features of that, of the San Francisco system and the Washington system that allowed uh, the San Francisco system to be so uh, stable over a long period of time. And, and, and I guess that raises a secondary question, which is what can break apart the San Francisco system today, uh, as we saw uh, in the interwar period? So those are big questions, but put them on the floor for all of you. David, you yeah, want to I, I, <coughs> I have a thought about that, and it, that's all it is, is a thought. But it comes top to top of my mind almost immediately when you pose the question that way, that the big difference is that the San Francisco system underwrote and was compatible with a reversion to American isolationism in the interwar period. And the big difference after World War II is the United States stays engaged. It remains an active participant in the maintenance uh, and health of the system. So in that sense, uh, the breakdown, uh, the difference between the two systems is that just a special case of the more general proposition that, as the a British historian once put it in 1918, world leadership was handed to the United States on a platter and the, office, uh, the offer was refused. And the United States reverted to a very <coughs> deeply uh, entrenched kind of isolationism. It did not after 1945. And it seems to me, just off the top of my head, that's the principal difference. And is that the principal threat today? That one, that my thought leads directly to your question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you. That's a big question. Yes, uh, I, I mentioned, as I mentioned about the uh, importance of between a relationship between uh, system and the outer elements. So the, about the Washington system, the powers can, cannot find the uh, good balancing point toward the outer elements. However, uh, San Francisco system, uh, the uh, Japan and uh, is Japan also and other countries uh, could find the other yes way to solve the outer element, for example, Soviet Union. Soviet Union joined the conference, however, Soviet Union cannot, uh, did not sign, maybe, they can sign, and also two Chinas. However, after the uh, conference, San Francisco Peace Conference, um, Japan, yes, uh, yes, and the ROC China in Taipei, yes, signed the uh, peace conference in 19, uh, 1952, and Japan and Soviet Union signed the treaty in uh, 1956, as the University has said. So the, uh, about the San Francisco system, uh, Japan and other countries could, yes, uh, cope with the uh, problems of outer elements. This is the difference uh, between the uh, Washington system and the San Francisco system, I think. And the uh, uh, second question is so, 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 so difficult to answer, but uh, uh, as you know, 
uh, Japan also uh, uh, keep the basis of the Washington system. However, uh, for example, uh, South Korea and other countries, when they, these countries uh, uh, signed the treaty with Japan, these countries were under the authoritarian state. So after the democratization of these countries, they maybe reclaim or re, yes, uh, yes, reclaim or re, uh, something, uh, re raise some projects towards Japan, I think. Uh, if Japan and other countries cannot solve such a new, mm -hmm. new elements, new situation around Japan and other countries, it is a big problem for us, I think. Uh, we compare the Washington shift demo uh, with uh, uh, San Francisco shift demo. The, so I think the uh, American involvement is uh, decisively uh, important. Americans' uh, commitment uh, covered not only military, uh, but also economically and uh, culturally. Uh, in, addition, in addition to uh, securing Asia with its overwhelming military power, uh, it didn't allow the, for the military revival of Japan. But uh, at the same time, uh, we shouldn't uh, ignore the uh, role of Japan. Uh, post war Japan, uh, as a uh, peaceful state, uh, they uh, paid a reparation, repar uh, and they, give, uh, they gave uh, economic assistance to uh, Southeast Asian countries. Uh, the four, uh, I think uh, uh, Japan was an uh, uh, honest player under the San Francisco uh, shift. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's very important uh, Japan uh, di didn't uh, become a uh, destabilizing factor uh, in the uh, international order in uh, Asia Pacific region. Um, I, would, I would view the 1920s and 30s China as an interim um, between the collapse of the Qing imperial order and the creation of a new order in China. It was the time when uh, the British uh, power was declining and the U.S. still um, engaged in the um, isolation. And the China, within China, there's different factions, um, different forces competing with each other. And the Japanese were tr was trying to replace um, uh, foreign powers to have a special interest in China. In that case, it's really hard to sustain a treaty uh, system um, back then. But in, in the 50s and 60s and beyond, I think um, I, uh, the, the whole international um, uh, s the whole international politics is, was more like rigid. You have like a U.S. dominated, and versus like um, the communist. There's a black and white sort of like you know Cold War's um, framework. Uh, in that way, I I in order to sustain the, the system, the treaty system, you need to have a power, a strong stronger power to 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 play that um, factor. So, if you ask me w in the future, what um, what would be the factor for to the the continuance? the continuation of this San Francisco system, I would say it depends on whether the U.S. had a strong commitment to um, in the East Asia and see whether, um, yeah, to engage more in, in the Asia Pacific affairs. That's it. Those are great answers and I think they hopefully will spark more conversation. If, uh, I'll call on people, but I ask you to wait for the microphone and also to just tell people who you are, so Tom. Hi. <coughs> um, my name is Tom Christensen. I'm from Columbia University. Really enjoyed the panel, and I have two quick questions, uh, just based on uh, the idea that uh, sort of accidents of history uh, help create the reality that we're in. And Professor Lin talked about uh, the status of Taiwan as undetermined under U.S. law, and that's something at the State Department we always have to live with. We don't always talk about, but it is it is the U.S. position that Taiwan's status is undetermined. But that was based on the idea that the San Francisco Treaty uh, was not a treaty that was signed by all the disputants in the war or all the combatants in the war. So what would happen if Russia and Japan today actually reached a peace treaty about the end of World War II, finally? I don't think it's on, we're on the cusp of that. 
but I wonder what kind of challenges that would pose to the United States because the legal position on Taiwan, which allows all the things you said, has always been based on the idea that Russia or the Soviet Union or the successor state Russia hadn't reached an agreement with Japan. And I think it might pose some challenges. The second part is about the Washington Treaty. And I always puzzle about this because I always see China as a country that has a much weaker military to the, than the United States to this day, but a military that poses huge challenges for the United States despite its relative weakness. The, the Washington Treaty, the 553, right? And everyone knows if that kept Japan down. But Japan, with 60% of the naval power of the United States in East Asia as an East Asian nation, posed an enormous challenge to the U.S. military, which was a had two, two oceans to deal with, had to deal with Europe and, and Asia, and was at a great distance from the Japanese Navy. So I, was, I think about that, that it wasn't such a bad deal for Japan in the sense of Japan's ability to defend its own neighborhood. Um, a 60% status for versus the U.S. Navy could be used uh, to use the current term as an anti-access area denial capability to keep the U.S. Uh, out of the region in a way that China's 60% if it, w if it were to reach that level, I don't think it's there yet, would be a real challenge to the U.S. military. Um, so uh, I wonder about that formula and how bad that really was for Japan. Anyone want to respond? Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, very interesting question. Actually, that did happen in the 60s and 70s um, when the Soviet actually secretly approached to Chiang Kai-shek and Chiang jing -guo. Um, in order to formulate a sort of quasi-alliance um, against uh, Chairman Mao uh, during the Cultural Re Revolution. So back then, if you read Chiang Kai-shek's diaries and all those declassified um, Chinese um, nationalist files um, in Taipei or at Hoover, you will find a very, very interesting, there's a very interesting dilemma for Chiang Kai-shek. And Chiang realized that, well, suddenly um, my daily enemy, um, enemy approached me and then proposed that, look, we can cooperate. Um, the Soviet virtually told uh, Taipei back then that you know the United States was trying to improve relations with the PRC, so there's no way that the U.S. government will support your dream of returning to China. Only the only power in the world can help you with this is um, the Soviets. <laughs> so Chiang Kai-shek was so worried about that. He said he wrote it in his diary, saying that you know for the past 20 years I have been educating my people that you know fan gong kang er anti-communist. Uh, resist on uh, the Russian. Now, I don't know how I should change my tune and then tell my people and my army that we probably will have to cooperate with the Soviet in order to launch a kind of joint action against the PRC during the Cultural Revolution. But when it comes to the, the RC and the PRC, and there's an interesting, also interesting indication that the Soviet did not rule out, um, back then, you know, in the, during the Cold War, did not rule out the possibility of recognizing uh, ROC and established diplomatic ties. But the problem is that the Kuomintang back then strongly refused to accept the two China formula. So that's also posed a um, problem for Chiang Kai-shek, Chiang Jing-guo, and all the nationalists. And, but maybe luckily to them, um, that kind of scenario never happened. Um, the Soviet only played Taiwan card against um, China back then. So when the Sino-Soviet relations gradually you know, stabilized, then Taiwan card was being discarded. Yes, uh, as Xiaoting Xiao said, yes, in uh, 1966 uh, some so Soviet, uh, not spy, maybe some um, envoys went to Taiwan to uh, consult with this problem with Jiang Jingguo and the other officials, is, uh, as Jiang Zidane already said. Uh, and about the, uh, yes, Taiwan the status, yes, if we check the uh, contents of the Cairo statement, yes, Cairo statement points out the uh, a Taiwan and the Pescado uh, had, or, 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 uh, were, yes, back to the, the ROC, right, so clearly. However, in the uh, San Francisco Peace uh, co uh, Treaty, just say, just said the Japan, yes, abandoned the territory only. Yes, some scholars said this is the, uh, yes, pressure of the Britain, not the USA, Britain said, so Japan only can, Japan, yes, uh, abandon, the, the territory only. Japan cannot say, cannot say the uh, territory will back to who, okay? This is the Britain's op opinion. Uh, secondly, about the, uh, yes, 553. Yes, uh, uh, yes, yes, you are right. Uh, for a Japanese point of view, yes, if China, uh, USA is five, Japan three, 
yes, because the USA is our face, uh, was his face with the Atlantic, yes, yeah, so two, two seas. So the USA has to divide the five, 2.5 uh, and 2.5. Japanese, Japan is three, <laughs> yes, or larger than the USA at the Pacific. This is the way, uh, thinking way of Japanese. However, uh, diplomats also uh, had to appreciate the Navy at that time. So Navy also uh, understand and accepted such a th uh, three, and, uh, three or 2.5 and, and three, this uh, ratio. However, at the time, the Japanese army are facing a much big problem. The yes, Japanese army, uh, yes, because the uh, Russia which, uh, changed to be a Soviet Union, so called Russia's pressure at the Siberia was decreased. So this armament of the army is a big problem for the Japanese army. So the Japanese army pointed out some, some, all c some crises of the Soviet Union to get much more money, budget to expand the army in the 90, uh, after the 90, uh, 24, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is the uh, uh, new situation in, uh, in Japan at the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Kutin Jiang, postdoc here uh, upstairs at A Park. So I have two quick questions. And first, the first one is, uh, what would be the actual indicators of a breakdown of the San Francisco system? So are we looking at wars or an alternative order or uh, anything of that sort? And the second question is, um, so to what extent does, say, the globalized production or supply chain actually help maintain the San Francisco system? Thank you. Good question. My short answer is that, <coughs> and it, because it's short, you should take it at the appropriate discount, um, that future historians might say that the, the precipitating event that really begins to dismantle the uh, San Francisco system is the U.S. withdrawal from the TPP. Okay. We're already on the road. <laughs> <laughs> you want to respond? Yeah. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, the San Francisco shift them, San Francisco shift them uh, have been uh, stable, uh, stable now. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, be because uh, uh, I think it's very interesting. Uh, China uh, will uh, support the San Francisco shift them uh, because uh, the f China worry about the uh, Japanese uh, military revival. The uh, floor, I think uh, it's a uh, very interesting uh, because uh, in 1950s, uh, China, China decried the San Francisco Treaty. They uh, tried to break the uh, f US Japan uh, security treaties. But uh, now uh, they are uh, contrary, uh, they uh, support the, the treaty. The floor, I think the Fran San Francisco system is uh, stable now. Well, can I come back to the the other part of the question, that's an interesting one. So to what degree does the, exi do the existence of uh, so-called global supply chains, integration of economies uh, in the region act as a uh, bulwark against the collapse of the current order? Or is that, do we sort of exaggerate the role, I'm thinking back historically, the role of uh, economics, if you will, uh, in overcoming the forces of nationalism and uh, the politics of nationalism. Let me just remind us all that in 1914, the two nations who were each other's greatest trading partners were Great Britain and Germany. No? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know. I, guess they I, 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 I like that answer, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Oh, Tom, let me, let me get a microphone in front of you and join the conversation. Uh, just that, that wasn't a transnational production thing. You know, I think that, that realist scholars in my field make that mistake all the time, comparing pre-World War I uh, economic interdependence with the transnational production mm -hmm. thing. They, they need those whole products in Britain and Germany. And they weren't sending parts back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth, assembling them into final products like they are now. Fair enough, and that's an important distinction. But it's just a note of caution about presuming that the old enlightenment dream of commercial connection actually voids the possibility of war, I think we should just be cautious. Okay. In the back, yeah.
Uh, good morning, my name is John Shea, and uh, on behalf of the uh, Taiwanese community, I would like to have a question. Which system can effectively uh, settle the final status of Taiwan? Uh, according to the uh, San Francisco Peace Treaty, Article, t Article 10, it said that Japan only renounced all the right back into the 1901. Nothing to touch about the Shimoroshiki Treaty. So uh, in that case, the Taiwan actually as of today is not really belongs to the uh, uh, China at all. But however, in Taiwan, still claiming that the, the, the uh, you know, the, there's a two team, one the blue team and one the green team. The blue team still, the blue team still c claim that today the Taiwan is the, uh, the, the, fight, the, end, the extending of the China Civil War. But, you know, uh, another group of people is thinking that the ending result of the you know, unsettled, unsettled status of the uh, uh, World War II. So which system can settle the problem? Put that to the end of the table there. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Frank. I think we talked about this before. I think it depends on how you interpret um, Cairo or like San Francisco Treaty. And I think I would say that this is rather a political um, issue than the purely legal um, issue. It depends still, there's, I, I have no answer at all. You know, I different groups will find um, whatever elements that is um, you know, suitable to his or her own arguments. So that's the reason why we still have such a huge debate and division within Taiwan today. So I really have no answer. It depends on from which perspective you interpret um, those um, paperwork. I don't know whether other scholars had opinion. Yeah. Uh, I have to one mention one uh, point that uh, in uh, 1952, uh, the uh, negotiation of, of the Sino Japanese, ROC Japanese uh, Peace Treaty, uh, yes. Uh, they, the, the both uh, representatives changed one memorandum. This peace treaty uh, will uh, be efficient at the region area that ROC government rules at present and in the future. Yes, so Japanese government uh, uh, recognizes, recognized ROC government rules during the Taiwan then. Yes, this is, I don't know, this is, this uh, memorandum is co was concerned about the so-called status problem. However, at the time, Japanese government, yes, uh, recognized ROC was ruling Taiwan. I don't risk at all. This is a fact, thank you. Well, let me ask a question uh, historically about that refers to today because there are comparisons that are made, I've seen them made uh, in, various places between Japan in the 1920s and 30s and China today. That is that the Japanese challenged the, the existing world order with the, based to some degree on uh, the belief and the perhaps the illusion that they could uh, successfully challenge the United States uh, in seeking uh, domination control of East Asia. And that comparison is made to China today, that China is sort of in the same, not only in the same role that Japan was at that time, but has the same illusions, perhaps, about its ability to challenge uh, American uh, domination in the region. Uh, what do you think about that comparison between the China of today and the Japan of the 1920s and 30s? Any of you? Well, I, I think both parts of the question are really about China because Japan's aspirations were principally focused on China and arguably didn't really go beyond that. And you could make a case that they were willing to settle as late as December 1941 for American acquiescence in their right. incursion in China in return for a pledge not to do anything further in East Asia. So I think the question is just a, a question about China and China's role in the East Asian system uh, twice over. Um, and I, it, it takes me back, Dan, to your earlier question about the difference between the two systems. And I suggested, and I won't, I won't back away from the suggestion that American engagement is the big 
uh, a big differenti differentiating factor. But another one, if I can put it this way, is the, the stabilization and the uh, political and territorial integrity of China itself, which was at issue. Uh, until late into, well into the 20th century, and it provided the opportunity for other powers to uh, assert their, their influence there. That's no longer an issue, it seems to me. China, China has uh, established itself as a sovereign state with uh, plenty of capacity to protect that. So China's stabilization is a major factor in, in the whole business. Uh, the, uh, you, I, I'm reminding myself, <laughs> so I just talk about this, of a remark that Franklin Roosevelt once made to the journalist Edgar Snow, who's a famous correspondent in Asia. He said something to the, right at the end of the war, the last months of the war, Roosevelt said to Snow, you know, the Japanese may have been a necessary evil mm -hmm. because they ended the colonial era in Asia. Uh, I, I, I can uh, introduce one episode. Uh, after the uh, Manchuria incident in 1931, uh, Japanese government, uh, yes, maybe, uh, maybe, the Japanese government imagined the USA and Britain the strong, strong pressure However, at the time, USA and Britain, yes, uh, yes, uh, was were against Japan uh, under the nine, nine uh, power treaty. So mo modestly, not so strong a, a, a strong opinion toward Japanese aggression toward Manchuria. So Japan escalated the level to the Man Manchu foundation of the Manchu War. And after the foundation of Manchu War, USA was so aggressive toward Japan. No. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, so oh, Japan, okay, let's escalate one more. Finally, at the hard note, USA was so strong toward Japan. Maybe it took, uh, took uh, six or seven years. Mm -hmm. So it's a big problem, I think. So uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know <laughs> the USA's diplomacy towards China now, <laughs> but uh, mm. uh, it's uh, some, yes, uh, but you can compare, uh, make the comparison, make the comparison you know, J Japanese case to China. Thank you. I want to pick up on the point that Could you uh, identify oh, yourself? I, Mike Lampton here at A Park as a fellow. I wanted to pick up on uh, I think twice stated by Professor Kennedy that American engagement's key, and I I fully agree with that. But the key is what's the key to American engagement is the next order question, and uh, I think you quoted early on America at the summit right after World War II. And part of that was an economic statement as well as military. And we, at the height, had, what, 45% of GD, global GDP. Actually, 50%. Well, <laughs> a big number. Yeah. And now we're, we can debate about it, but somewhere around 15% of global GDP. And now China's the leading trade partner <coughs> of every country in Asia, practically. So I guess my question is, is, is American engagement, as you think of it in the previous period, sustainable with one third, with two thirds drop in the percentage of global GDP that the US represents? Well, again, my, my reflex answer is engagement is possible with a less dominant role in the whole international economic and political scene but dominance or hegemony is much more difficult for just as all the question answers itself, I suppose. Um, again, just go, let me go back briefly to Woodrow Wilson. A, a lesser known part of Wilson's agenda um, was to build an American merchant fleet and to relax rules for uh, American international banking facilities to operate overseas and so on as a way of creating interests American interests in the international system, a really hard economic and financial interest as a way to make concrete uh, the terms of America's engagement with the world. So again, uh, nationalist and mercantilist uh, policies, uh, uh, autarkic policies, th that's the flavor of a lot of what we're talking about today under the rubric of America First seem to me to be guaranteed to undermine the, the felt uh, necessity in this society for engagement with the world. Um, my name is Deepak Bangalore, uh, Stanford alum, and uh, uh, 
a serial entrepreneur from the valley, whatever that means. Uh, I've been to Japan maybe uh, once every three weeks for a long time, and I understand Japan. And uh, when you folks claim that uh, most of the uh, antagonism or the strife or conflict was because of militarism back in the 1930s, I think that's a very convenient uh, excuse because I was there when uh, in the 80s, the Japanese treated Americans as uh, imbeciles pretty much. And uh, uh, so uh, it's, it's not just militarism. It's, it's a very uh, fundamental Japanese attitude towards other people. Now, having said that, uh, let, let that not color my next statement, which is uh, y if you look at reality, you folks are vassals of the United States, okay, plain and simple. So when you're looking at the future of uh, the international order in East Asia, why are we talking to our vassals? Why aren't the Russians or the mainland Chinese here? And that's my question. I'm not quite sure what the question is, but does anyone want to respond? my colleagues, but I'm going to take a pass on that. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? I'm so yeah. That's what we're in a hurry to do that. Good morning. My name is Richard Wong, and I first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, thank you all the panelists here. I learned a great deal regarding to uh, um, the past, the history, of uh, what what uh, I miss uh, uh, or, or what have happened, so my my question, or perhaps even in opinions, you know, I mean, with could we focus a little bit more toward the future, as far as how we could, you know, uh, uh, maintain this stability? I, I I don't think I I, I think it's a, it's a question of balance. What we're trying to uh, what I'm trying to find, you know, in terms of international. Uh, engagement, you know, so I, I do have a little bit background with uh, Central South America and also part of Europe. Mm -hmm. So, so my question really pretends to: Can we talk a little bit more about how we move on to the future? Not so much, not not so much in a sense that uh, we should focus on power for sustainability, but more into into what is happening in the world today that we should really. Uh, um, you know, uh, have a discussion on. So uh, it's, it's not that, I'm, I'm not looking for the shift of, of, of this conference, but, but, but the <laughs> thought about creating, uh, creating future conferences to talk a little bit about how we could move on in spite of what is going on, you know, with the administration or with, or, 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 or with div or, or different government in Asia. Y yes. Uh, the, uh, uh, historian must not talk on the hi future, right? But uh, uh, in the afternoon, uh, panel two and panel three will talk on the uh, problem in the future. However, uh, we can yes uh, uh, talk uh, something about the future. At first, uh, San Francisco system uh, uh, consists of two elements. The first about the uh, San Francisco Peace Treaty itself. The other one, second, is the uh, security treaties including Sino-Japanese and uh, yes, tai Taiwan, U US, Taiwan, U ROC, and others. So uh, these two systems, uh, yes, uh, uh, st still efficient now. However, as you know, the in East Asia, uh, and, 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 uh, sorry, secondly, uh, the uh, economic uh, aspects. Um, under the Cold War, the Jap uh, so -called supply chain was divided in East Asia in 1950s. However, under this situation, Japan, uh, Japanese private companies made a uh, trade with PLC, right. Communist China. And uh, in, uh, before and after 1972, Japan, yes, concluded the treaty uh, with PLC. However, Japan continues the uh, trade relation, economic and uh, cultural relation with Taiwan. Okay, so uh, this new uh, supply chain was expanded beyond the uh, east and west, or uh, communist and uh, uh, free, 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 free society. So 
Also in East Asia, there are some uh, strong, strong uh, division on the security. Uh, uh, for example, between the uh, uh, 38 line and the Korean Peninsula and the Taiwan Strait. However, uh, East Asia uh, uh, is a country has got some sub su uh, supply chains all over East Asia. That's the first. Uh, so, how however, now that uh, we are we we have some new challenging ch challenges like uh, Korean Peninsula issues unification, or a Taiwan Strait problem. The uh, some North in Korean, Korean Peninsula and Taiwan Strait were built before and after Korean War. But this situation uh, is challenged by new, new as Chinese rise and other factors. So the, there are two, two or three new uh, factors. One is the, about the security. Second of the uh, supply chain of the current one. Yes. How to keep those two elements is so crucial for us, but uh, it is so difficult to uh, prospect in the future. Thank you. I, I will point out that, uh, so this conference is organized around the theme of the past, present, and future international order in East Asia. This panel is obviously focused on the past. Uh, and I believe the next panel is probably more focused on the present, and then later in the afternoon, uh, we're going to look at the future. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an idea to this. <laughs> um, there's an, so uh, why we're focused on the past. <laughs> so if I could just take up, come back to the question of American isolationism, and maybe I'm putting this more on you, David, but because um, I think that is the question that people have today when they look at uh, America first ideology of Trump, when they look at the sort of politics of the United States today, the sort of ro this, how much of this uh, is our, do we see elements of continuity, if you will, with the past history of American isolationism, including the in the interwar period, are we are we simply returning to the themes of the past, or do you see uh, is there a kind of post Cold War uh, shift in the way in which we're thinking about ourselves in the world, and the United States is thinking about ourselves in the world that's different from the isolationism of the past? And I think that I'd like to sort of raise the question to the other members of the panel as you're looking at the United States. How much do you see a sort of resurgence of, a, of an isolationism of the past, or do you see some other phenomenon perhaps that we're not thinking about that is a response to globalization? People talk about uh, their sort of common responses we see in Europe and the United States and even in Japan to the challenges of a globalized economy and the undermining of sort of a sense of uh, stability and economic uh, uh, confidence in all of these societies that's probably maybe distinct from the kind of isolationism and the depression of the 1930s. So, big questions, but anyway. Big questions indeed. I, I do think that there was a long period, let's call it roughly a quarter century after World War II, when all the cultural authorities in our country, in this society, converged on the, um, the, the notion that isolationism was a defunct and obsolete and no longer relevant a guiding principle for American diplomacy. And that, that, that was high orthodoxy, I'd say, until the Vietnam War, when it got seriously challenged. And you remember George McGovern's campaign slogan in 1972, America come home again. That sounds an awful lot like make America great again to me. <laughs> uh, so I think uh, in that era, maybe a lot of people uh, underestimated just how deeply rooted and latently available was the sentiment of isolationism. We saw it uh, come back to, to some degree in the post-Vietnam era. We're seeing it again now. I think a lot of people in this country have um, uh, accumulated the, the, the sense that the, uh, the life of a hegemon is difficult and they don't want to really support the burdens of hegemony any longer. They're, they'd be content to see a lesser American presence in the world uh, and pay a lesser price to maintain that presence. So I, I think uh, we're, we're th this deep tradition, which is underwritten, not least of all by geography, just the scale of life on this continent, you know, with the, along with the Canadians and the Mexicans, who are about as big as the European Union. And our prospects for some kind of, let me go back to the earlier comments, supply chain autonomy, if we really wanted to pursue that kind of a policy, is, is not altogether unrealistic. Any of the rest of you want to respond? No? Go. 
Yes, uh, it's a big question, but uh, um, uh, after the, uh, yes, Beijing Protocol in the 1901, yes, 100 years ago, uh, USA prepared this scholarship to invite so many Chinese, Chinese students to the USA's university. So USA cultivated so many, yes, yeah, Chinese young girls at the time. So uh, as uh, when the USA adopted the cause of Monroe Doctrine and some isolation policy, however, at that time, USA still had some commitment with such a cultural and economic yes, way to, towards ch China. It, is so it was so efficient uh, towards East Asian in, in such an international relations, I think. Yeah, Philip Lipsy, uh, A Park and Political Science. So um, I, I think one of the lessons that comes out from the panel is that Japan has had a very complicated relationship with the international order, uh, both in the past and through the present. And I want to ask you, basically, you know, what what does Japan want from the order, and what should it want, right? And so you, you think about, you know, when I when I pose this question to Japanese diplomats, they typically say, well, you know, we're too weak; we really can't influence the order, so it's it's kind of irrelevant. But you know, suppose Japan did have influence, you know, what would the order? look like, um, you know, and it, it, you just think about the kinds of things Abe says about, you know, his goal is to escape from the post-war regime on the one hand, uh, but on the other hand, he's hugging the U.S. more tightly than ever. But on the other hand, he's hugging a president who seems to be undermining the international order as we speak. Um, so th there's a whole series of contradictions, right? Reviving the TPP on the one hand, which seems to be supportive of the order, but on the other hand, you know, withdrawing from the IWC and attacking UNESCO for history issues and so forth. And so, you know, does Japan actually have a policy towards the order, uh, aside from sort of a case-by-case -case approach? Um, and if not, then what should the policy be? Maybe I'll ask Professor Inouye to address that question since you raised that in your presentation. When you talked about Resurgent Japanese nationalism and what it represented. So, yeah. Uh, now, now uh, Japanese nationalism is refurging, refurging. Uh, but uh, I think uh, the, uh, the mm, yes, uh, the most important thing is uh, economic diplomacy. Uh, is uh, uh, traditionally uh, Japan. Uh, gives uh, uh, economic assistance and uh, cultivate a market uh, to all over the world, uh, and they gain the profit. Therefore, I think this is a uh, uh, principle of Japanese diplomacy. Therefore, uh, I think uh, the what the Japanese diplomacy hope uh, is uh, uh, to a stable international environment uh, to extend the economic diplomacy. And our uh, second is, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, it's a most preferable, most favorable uh, yeah, diplomatic course is uh, uh, Japan keeps the uh, alliance with the United States. At the same time, uh, Japan has uh, the friendship relationship with uh, China. The four, uh, the I think the uh, China Japan relations and the U.S. Japan relations uh, is uh, compatible. Is a very important. It's a uh, favorable for the Japanese diplomacy. Maybe this will be our last question. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jim Sho from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and I appreciate this discussion this morning. I wanted to ask, um, again, a kind of a comparison question between then and now uh, in terms of broader global activity uh, or, and uh, incidents or experience and their impact on the situation in Asia. So to what extent is the evolution of order in Asia or a breakdown of the current system uh, inextricably linked to events outside of the region. So would the previous system have collapsed without the rise of conflict in Europe, for example? Is it, and if there are, is greater conflict in the Middle East, whether it comes stems from a competition with Iran or other types of dynamics, does that add fuel to the fire or complicate the situation or is there 
some almost autonomy or it, it's really about what happens in Asia itself as being the key issue. Yeah, yes, about the uh, yeah, past situation. Yes, uh, I mentioned about the processes uh, to break uh, the Washington system. Uh, however, in the uh, 1920s and the, the uh, mm, maybe uh, the first uh, yes, two, two or three years in the uh, 1930s, Japanese government still kept the uh, some uh, cooperation with the other powers in the global norms. Like uh, Japan signed the uh, London Disarmament Treaty in 1930 and others. So, uh, and also in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, two groups was divided on this point. The w European and the Western group and the Asian group. European group uh, diplomats were committed, uh, committed with such a global norms. However, Asian group were just stressed on the importance of Asia or, or autonomous of Asia. So um, after the Japan, uh, yes, uh, for, uh, the Manchukuo War was founded and uh, the Asian group, their group, yeah, yes, so got much more power and uh, the European and the global, uh, global Western group was uh, yes, uh, not controlled, but uh, yes, uh, sustained by such a Asian group. So this situation is so a typical case, I think. Thank you. Okay, well, I, I hope everybody enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. Uh, I think it was a great start to the day, and we will conclude, and I'd like to ask everybody to give a hand to our uh, speakers. <laughs> and I turn it over to whatever the lunch phase is here, whoever's in charge of that, not me. Thank you. Thank you all. Can we bring lunch thank back you. in here? Is that yeah, you can eat, eat at your place. And thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>